Okay. Maybe. Okay. The video goes on and on. Alors, c'est bon, Jacques? Oui, c'est bon. OK, je peux reprendre? Oui, oui, on t'entend très bien, là. OK, entendu. Connecté. Malheureusement, oui, donc apparemment. Mais je ne vois pas un jet Sumna. Pourquoi? Je le voyais maintenant. Je ne la vois plus. Bon, ben écoute. Euh, oui. Je vais te mettre en... Euh, bah, qu'elle parle pour que je vois si elle, elle apparaît quand elle parle oui que oui, 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 que sont... oui 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 ok parfait oui comme ça c'est bien c'est bien ouais. donc euh, I will start again and sorry for yeah. this technical uh, problem again, we have a lot of problems huh? You are hearing me properly? Yes. Okay. So I will start again. I have been asked several times questions about my own method of preparing questions in this interview with Jetsumna Tenzin Palm. And I see it is good to answer them publicly and once for all. Since The first interview, I have been keen to make sure that these interviews are original in their subject and their method. It is a bit like when a wise man interprets a sacred text with a simple and small difference that here he is interpreting and explaining his own text and his own teachings and words. This will allow the sage to elucidate and to clarify these teachings and the disciple and the listener or reader to deepen and grasp these same teachings. So I had to go back to the books of Jetsumna and read them carefully in order to identify the issues from which I formulated my questions. The great model of this method is Plato in his dialogues where we read Socrates going deeper into his teachings. In the Indian, in the Indian tradition, a similar approach is found in the, in the so-called mandala circle method where the sage traces a circle with his teachings and then by interpreting these same teachings traces another circle which begins at the same starting point and ends at the same point but whose scope is larger and more exhaustive which enable him to identify new points in his own teaching and to make it more comprehensible and clear. As far as I am concerned, it was a great pleasure for me to read Jetsumna Tenzin Palmo and to deepen with her, her own very rich teaching. Although it took me a lot of time, especially at the beginning. And I hope that the listeners like it, this somewhat academic and philosophical method. It allows anyway, when the answers are transcribed, transcribed to have a consistent collection of talks and that comments her old books without, however, spotting them. For my side, This collaboration was very enriching and fruitful. And I hope it will be the same for her and for the listeners. It seemed useful to me to elucidate this poem so that all the listeners are sure that the book which will gather all these interviews will not repeat the old books of Jetsumna, but will deepen them and 
that the more she digs into her old books, the more she dig deeper and extract new topics and new approaches. Finally, today we'll finish interpreting the second book, this one, Daily Life as a Meditative Practice. And we will start in the next tense interview, the third and last book, this one, Commentaries on Meditation, and hope we can have enough time to finish this precious, precious third book. Jetsumna Tenzin Palmo, welcome with us, especially after your long silence. And before starting our questions, for what this silence and why you do silence each and every year for one month or maybe more? Well, nice to see you again, Laris. Um, mainly it's because I spend most of my day dealing with correspondence and administration or meeting with many people who come every day. And so it's nice just to have a break, frankly, and to um, have a time just to be quiet and go inside instead of endlessly, um, you know, dealing with outer activities. So every year we, I do one month and the nuns who are studying a Buddhist philosophy most of the year, um, they do a two month silent retreat. They're still in retreat at the moment. They finish at the end of the month. So during that time for two months, um, they do not speak. They, they can do chanting of course, in accordance with their practices, but uh, they don't speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, for you, the same, you, you keep silent for to the total month? Well, for me, I go, I go into my room and close the door, so then I don't meet anybody. I mean, they are practicing together, so they see each other, but they don't speak. I, I, don't, I just stay in, in seclusion in my room, and I don't meet anybody, so then I don't need to speak. In Buddhism, uh, we talk uh, usually about noble silence. It is your case, this is a, a kind of noble silence? Yes, I mean, you're not being silent just because you're being sulky or because there's no one to talk to, but you're keeping an inner silence. The idea is that the outer silence of not speaking reflects your inner silence as the mind begins to quieten down. We get very distracted through our speech with each other. And so if you're not speaking, then it gives you the opportunity to go inside and not distract others as well as not distracting oneself. Mm. Okay, Tiki. So we'll start our regular uh, question, Zetsumna. The first question, you say in your book, Daily Life as a Meditative Practice, you say, when you answer me, you will point the finger to the center of your chest and not your head. When we feel something very deep, we power to our heart. And my question, do you mean by that our true identity is essentially in our heart and not in the head? Okay, so I mean, the point is that when you, if you accuse me of something, I would say, you mean me? And I point here at the, the heart chakra. I don't say you mean me? and point at the brain, which is interesting because here we have most of our sense organs, our eyes, ears, nose, taste, and yet we don't, and the brain, and yet we don't point at that. We point, when we say me, we, we point inwardly just right here, just naturally we do that. I mean, the point is that neuroscientists themselves are now finally agreeing that consciousness our consciousness is not not in the brain, right? Consciousness is primary and creates 
the brain icon and the brain icon does not create consciousness, which is an enormous step forward for science to recognize that, right? So then, you know, where is consciousness? Well, consciousness doesn't dwell anywhere. Consciousness is all pervading. But for example, when great practitioners die, they, in the Tibetan tradition, uh, they often go into uh, what is called tukdam. And in that, the body is dead. The brain is dead. And, um, you know, the whole body is gone, but the heart chakra is still warm. This has confused Western doctors when great lamas have died. And as far as the doctors are concerned, they're gone, they're dead. But when people say, well, feel the heart, the heart chakra, not the, the physical heart, the heart chakra in center of the chest, they feel it's still warm. And the body does not go into rigor mortis or start to decay. They can stay in this state of meditative absorption for hours, days, and even weeks. But always there is that warmth there, right? So it's like at the time of death, consciousness um, kind of gathers itself into its primary source and, and sits at the heart chakra. So, I mean, this is something which, uh, you know, everybody um, has verified. Mm -hmm. So in that way, and, and as I say, you know, we somehow intuitively know that because when we think about myself, we point here, I mean, right at the center of our being. We know that even though science up until now has never verified that and has thought that the brain was the most important part. We could slit ourselves here and, and put ourselves on the machine and we would still be alive. But from the point of the, from a spiritual and as well as a physical point of view, apparently that's not true. We're not actually, the brain is the, is the, the machine, but it's not the energy driving the machine. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there some special place in the body where, uh, consist, uh, where the consciousness is? Well, usually consciousness is everywhere. I mean, it's all pervading. But at mm. the time of death, then it gathers itself together and the gross consciousness uh, dissolves into uh, a more subtle consciousness. And then the subtle consciousness dissolves into the very subtle consciousness. And the very subtle consciousness resides in the heart chakra. Mm -hmm. But after this, where uh, consciousness, where it go? It, it travels up into other realms. I mean, it, you it know, has... death is like a portal into a whole different existence. That's the point. I mean, death is not the end. Death is just a continuation. And, um, you know, we leave behind the body. The body is not us. The body is described as being like a hotel room. You live in it for a bit, but then you leave it and you go into another hotel room. Mm. I mean, we make a mistake when we identify ourselves with our body. I mean, the, the, the immortal aspect, the deathless aspect of ourselves is our consciousness. In Hinduism, uh, sometimes uh, we are we confused between Atman and consciousness. I think it is not the, the case in Buddhism. Well, you know, again, Lewis, these are all words. What do you mean by Atman? If you think of Atman as me, as a bigger, better, more wonderful me, which is eternal and always me, then the Buddha said, no, it's not like that. But if you think of the consciousness as like a river, which is endlessly flowing, and you look at the river today and you say, this is the river, this is its name. Tomorrow you come back and say, oh, it's the same river. But it's not the same river because moment to moment to moment, it's changing, it's moving. It, it's not something static. So, mm. I mean, if you met yourself in your last lifetime, you wouldn't know who you were. Maybe you were a different gender. Maybe you weren't even human. Mm. And next lifetime, who knows who you're going to be, right? 
but mm. in this lifetime we we identify ourselves with our body and with our memories and our race and our gender and our profession and we think this is me mm. but this is not me these are all transitory events which are creating like a character on a stage you know mm. but mm. it uh, what is is actually going to transfer to next lifetimes and has come from past lifetimes is the stream of our consciousness and our non-dual consciousness. We discussed this before. You know, uh, usually we are caught up in our dualistic mind, right? Me mm -hmm. and others. But there's a deeper level of our consciousness, which is called the deathless or the mm -hmm. unconditioned. That could be compared to an Atman if we are not thinking it's me, because it's that level of consciousness which connects us with everything. Our ordinary mm. dualistic consciousness separates us. Our non-dualistic consciousness, which is the ultimate level of the mind, connects us with everything. So therefore, it's, it's the, this is why the Buddha said un-Atman. It's not Atman in the sense of, Atman just means I. Mm. And if we think of it as a bigger, better, more wonderful me, then that's delusion. But if we see it as the dissolving of the I, then that is liberation. We're liberating ourselves from this ego dualistic mind. Jetsumna, mm. in the same context, you go to say in page uh, 281, you say Tibetans, Tibetans know that the brain is connected to the thought, but that the thought is not the mind. The term chitta means both heart and mind. My question, can we separate thought and mind or spirit in French, esprit, it is uh, spirit, especially since most people consider the mind to be the whole or even the origin of our thoughts? Well, I mean, partly it's what we just discussed before. Um, the thoughts, are, thoughts and our emotions are like the waves on the surface of the ocean, right? They go up and they go down. And mostly that's where we live. We live on the surface of the ocean, right? Up on the waves and down on the waves, right? But that's not the whole ocean. We know that, right? But normally we can't go below the surface of the waves because we're so busy talking to ourselves. But when we have, when we meditate, right? This is what meditation is for. We recognize that our, our mind, our heart mind, it doesn't mean the brain, chatter, 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 but the whole of mind, chitta in itself is something very vast, like the ocean, right? And the thoughts are merely an aspect of that. It's just an, an aspect of the whole and not even maybe the most important part, right? So it, thoughts are important, but they're not the whole story. And when in meditation, thoughts are stilled, when the thoughts quiet down, then our consciousness opens up to many much deeper levels of, of, of being, which are usually unavailable because we're always chattering to ourselves yak 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 the mind goes and so we are caught on the surface if we quieten the mind down then our consciousness goes to deeper and deeper levels vast vast levels beyond any understanding of our ordinary conceptual thinking mind mm -hmm. right so our, our consciousness is vast Mm. But, the, but we, we imprison it in the surface level of our conceptual thinking. Mm -hmm. Jetsumna, you say in the same context, when we meditate, we must therefore learn to bring the energy down to the heart. This is my question number three. And the question is, why and how do we bring the energy down to the level of the heart? Okay, so normally, as I say, we're on the surface, we're, we're stuck up in our brain, right? We're, mm -hmm. We are always thinking our neural pathways are very, very active, and that's where we live. 
And we think that's the whole, whole, that's the whole thing. And we don't understand. But when our concentration is relaxed, but merged with the object of the concentration, whatever it is, then it releases us mm. from our fixation at a purely mental or ego-driven um, level of conceptualization. And it allows us to experience a much deeper level of consciousness. I mean, great artists, musicians, and um, others, they experience this, you know, at a time of inspiration, when they are go there, they are so merged in their um, composition, whatever, painters, art, musicians, even sports people, they, they completely merge with the object of their, uh, whatever they are creating. And then that goes beyond the ego. And that's mm. when genuine creativity and inspiration arise. That's when, you know, if they are really in tune with that, which bypasses the, mm. the brain to a much deeper level of their being, they feel it. And that's when people say, oh, they're, they're, they're geniuses, they are inspired. You know, that was a brilliant piece of, of creativity beyond mm. the ego. The ego is very habit forming. It, it's mm. very unoriginal. It's, it's very yeah. uncreative, but mm -hmm. we have deeper levels of consciousness, which bypass the brain activity. Okay. Jetsumna, uh, you say also in the same topic, uh, speaking of latent uh, human skills, you say, my question number four, in page 285, you say, the Tibetans give the example of a man who has a chest full of infinite treasures buried under his fireplace, but he no longer remembers them and consequently lives like a beggar. My question, what exactly are these forgotten treasures and why and how are they so? Okay, so the hidden treasures obviously means the true nature of our being. You know, we are so fixated on, on our brain activity that we have ignored the deeper levels of our consciousness. That's the point. We are not, we are not the ego-driven identity with whom we normally associate through our conceptual ego, right? But our normal ego thinking is very, very small, very, very limited. And our true nature, our true nature is vast and luminous knowing, right? The fullness of our wisdom and compassion. So this is our treasure house, which we have within us. But we don't recognize it. We don't see it. And so we identify with our little ego mind. And that's our tragedy, right? We think we're beggars and we don't realize that actually we're billionaires. Mm -hmm. How sad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jitsumna, ego and mind are same thing. And the ego in itself, we are always talking uh, bad things about ego, but ego has not something, some positive qualities. Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, um, until we are at a very, very advanced spiritual level, we have the ego. So therefore, the importance is to have a healthy, I used to be this way, uh, a healthy, well-balanced ego. Um, and, and for this reason, the Buddha himself taught that uh, first we learn how to make the mind quiet, tamed, and usable, workable, right? Through uh, calm abiding meditation. And that means that we are psychologically healthy. We have to have a healthy, well-balanced sense of self. And along with that, uh, meditations like on loving kindness and compassion, we have to uh, first direct it towards ourselves, 
in other words, towards our sense of self, right? In order to become healthy, strong and confident, and in that way, walk the path to that realization which goes beyond the ego. Are you with us? Okay, okay, one minute. You are frozen, like our ego. We lost. Mm. lost in cyberspace. That good we have this, you see, this yep. is what happens. Definitely. Oh, he was cut, but now he's coming back. I just uh, uh, <laughs> <added> him again. <laughs> This is like Manas mm -hmm. and that's Kailash. Which side is the lake on the Tibetan or the Nepali side? Uh, Tibetan side. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing yeah. me? Yes. Sorry, sorry, all with technical problems in Lebanon. <laughs> uh, uh, today, especially a lot of technical problems. Never uh, mind. Okay. Jetsumna, uh, my question number five, concerning the conception of me you say in page 307 you say it is good to not eat meat and to be clean but it has nothing to do with enlightenment my question yet most sages and yogis insist on a vegetarian diet and repeat the well known formula in yoga, we are what we think and what we eat. Like, so what role does a healthy diet play in the spiritual path? Okay, well, I mean, certainly I would endorse a vegetarian or even a vegan diet on the grounds of compassion. You know, we don't eat animals because animals also want to have a happy life. You know, what right have we to take the life of someone who themselves, just as we do, mm. want not people to harm us. So animals likewise do not want people to harm them, right? But nonetheless, in fact, most Tibetan lamas and practitioners are very carnivorous. They eat a lot of meat. And the Buddha himself and his disciples ate whatever was put into their arms bowl, they were not allowed to discriminate. So if someone offered them meat, they ate meat, right? Um, and so despite eating meat and onions and garlic, they nonetheless achieved very deep levels of spiritual attainment, right? Mm -hmm. Whether they eat meat or not. And in fact, Tibetan doctors, if one has pranic imbalance from doing too much meditation, for example, mm -hmm. and starts getting psychological or physical problems from too much pushing and too much strain in trying to meditate you know, for hours and things like this, they will tell them to go away and eat meat in order mm -hmm. to stabilize uh, mm -hmm. the, the mind and the body. So um, they're, they're no, by no means, you know, it's mostly Hindus. Brahmins and um, upper castes, the higher castes, who advocate about the importance of a pure diet, right? Mm. I mean, in some Mahayana sutras, this is mentioned, but basically, it's a Hindu idea. Mm -hmm. it, it, the uh, question of meat in Buddha's life, the Jetsumna, mm. uh, he is always preaching to not. Uh, to not attend to, to respect all kinds of life and in the other side we see that he agreed with the monks to eat meat is there no contradictions there's certainly a contradiction i mean in tibet of course it was very difficult i mean in the buddha he just said you accept whatever you people put into your to your uh, arms bone you should not discriminate so fair enough 
uh, in Tibet because it was very high and the climate was very harsh and the land was very poor. So therefore um, they didn't have much of a growing season. So therefore, um, I mean, some Tibetan lamas were vegetarian, but very few, uh, mostly they, but what they did was that they would, for example, slaughter one yak and that yak would last many people for a whole year. They had a lot of dried meat. They would not eat small animals like chickens. They did not fish and they only ate a big animal, which would be one life, which mm. would feed a lot of people for a long time. So that much they did. They understood it wasn't a good thing to do, but um, because they, they had a very, very restricted diet, uh, they, they didn't see any way to get around it. There wasn't much else to eat in Tibet. I mean, roasted barley flour, some uh, yogurt. Really, there wasn't that much. I assure you, <laughs> they had a very limited <laughs> diet. And, and so that's why, why they also ate meat in that day. But of course, nowadays, when they're in India and, and Nepal, they certainly should all be vegetarian. I'm not defending them. Jetsumna, what about garlic and onion? If we look, if we look to uh, Ayurveda or all, even the traditional and Western medicine, they say that garlic has a very important uh, medical properties, even also onion. Why you say that garlic and onion, and not only you, even uh, uh, so many yogis say that it is not to... Well, I mean, this it's considered to be tamasic. Tamasic, mm -hmm. is it? Yes. I mean, anyway, it's considered to be an, um, that it arouses a lot of um, negative energies, I think. I mean, as I say, you know, Buddhism is not really concerned with what you eat. I mean, because as far as um, attaining to spiritual dimensions and concern, whether you live on an all meat diet or a totally vegan diet, doesn't seem to really affect the nature of the mind. But um, from an Ayurvedic point of view and a Hindu point of view, then uh, there are many restrictions. And for example, the Jains, also, apart from being very vegan, they also don't eat um, uh, the, those vegetables which are grown under the ground, like potatoes and things inside the ground. Yeah, so root vegetables they don't eat either. They consider those also to be negative. So, I mean, different religions have different restrictions on, on what you eat. Buddhism in the whole doesn't have much restriction. Except in the Mahayana traditions, like in China and Korea, Vietnam, where they are vegan. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a other big topic in our uh, uh, interview today. It is about the gurus, spiritual master. You deal with this subject of guru in details in your book. You say first in page uh, 316, it is my question number six. Wherever I go, there are two questions I am always asked. First, how to transform my anger. Second, and how to find a teacher. These questions are both very complex, you say. My question, a true and revelant remark. So why do you think we go around in circles? all our lives trying to reduce our anger and find a teacher. Is it so complex, so difficult? So? Well, you know, first of all, um, as to anger, right, dealing with anger, then people are not very popular if they have an angry temperament. You know, people tend to avoid them. And also they're not at peace within themselves. So therefore, they're anxious to learn how to overcome their anger so that they will feel better within themselves and they can deal better with their relationships. So uh, this is a very common question, how to overcome this negative emotion of anger. But when it comes to the guru, when it comes to a teacher, again, you know, in setting out 
into a new territory, you know, it's helpful to have a guide, right? Who knows the way. They know the way because they're familiar with that route. They know the destination because they've, they've reached that destination. So we can trust them, right? This is a good guide. They know the way. They know what obstacles to avoid on the way. They know the shortcuts and, and so forth. So, so in that way, we, we can trust them. So likewise, on a spiritual path, we need a genuine teacher right, in order to know how to practice, what to practice, what obstacles to avoid, and so forth, right? But the problem is to find a teacher who has both the knowledge, because they themselves have gained the realization they're talking about, compassion, and the integrity it's really not so easy since it's hard to judge, right? To judge when the guru, when we usually see a teacher, they're sitting on their, their throne or their seat and they're speaking so nicely and, and saying all the right things, right? But we don't know what they're really like behind the scenes. This is the problem, right? So we have to be discriminating, we have to be careful, and we should not be naive. Just because the guru looks very nice or is very charismatic does not necessarily mean they are trustworthy. As we find out more and more in, in this day and age with all the scandals coming up about gurus all over, we have to be very, very careful. And it's not easy. Mm. Okay. Uh, is it Sumna, uh, before going on on the topic of guru about anger itself and many people wrote to me and asked me to ask you, did you come before your own anger? It is a personal question, but they asked me so many times about it. I'm not an especially angry person. I, I'm fairly placid. I mean, I get very annoyed with my computer sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not saying I'm completely beyond anger. That would be ridiculous. No, 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 no. But anger is not a particular problem. Um, but I, I see that some people have a very deep, deep anger inside themselves that mostly they're, they're okay, but suddenly something will trigger it and it's like a volcano right mm. it's like mostly the volcano is quiet and just a few puffs of smoke but then suddenly it erupts and they are swept away by it and and something it's very very deep so in in buddhism as in in probably any other uh, spiritual path there's a lot of attention to giving uh, various techniques for helping us to uh to, to recognize our anger and then to uh, transform it. Um, this, this very powerful energy, which uh, if it's transformed can be uh, a very profound spiritual energy, but normally it, it is not transformed and in that way it becomes very destructive. But sometimes, you show some anger. Is it just a, a superficial and uh, anger? Yeah, I mean, you know, annoyance is one thing, you know, but uh, genuine. I mean, anger, of course, has many manifestations, and um, you know, what we're really talking about is the kind of anger which is hatred. Hatred is a very negative emotion, and is very destructive to the person who nurtures hatred within themselves. And, and so a lot of the, um, the, the, the techniques and tools are for helping us to transform our, our anger and hatred into positive emotions. Okay. Let's uh, go on the topic, the big topic of guru and master. You said in the same uh, context, uh, 
in the page 319 by question number seven. You say sometimes this ideal of finding the perfect guru is just another form of laziness. My question, is this then a mere pretext for not going for uh, it and uh, perceiving in the past, per uh, persevering in the past? You know, what I meant there was that, I mean, there are people who do not make any effort, right? to find a teacher or even to practice by themselves, you know, with the help of, there are many books nowadays and also a lot of online instruction So they don't bother with that because they are waiting for the perfect guru to spontaneously appear, right? And simply zap them into instant enlightenment. So they're just waiting, you know, when the, when the, Pupil is ready, the, the master appears. So they are they don't make any effort on their side. Uh, they're just waiting for the perfect. And their excuse is that when the perfect master appears, that then everything will be resolved immediately. So as I say, that's just really being uh, spiritually lazy. It, it, and they never will find a, a teacher in that manner. But I have met people who th think like that, you know, because they have this idealistic idea that somehow the teacher is searching for them and they're going to just meet and that's going to be it. Mm. But it usually doesn't work that way. Jetsumna, you had your own master and what is uh, the help, uh, the big help it has uh, uh, begin to you by this presence of your master in your life? Well, I mean, my teacher was, uh, to my mind, uh, the, the perfect example of how a, a realized and compassionate being would actually work. So he was um, my great inspiration on the path. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Yes, yes. Are you hearing okay. me? Uh. Right. So, I mean, for, for me, he was, um, you know, and of course he gave direction, you know, I mean, I would say, what shall I do? And he would say, well, you do this practice or that practice. And um, also when I was in re long retreats and I would go every year to meet him, I would have a list of questions which had come up during that time, which uh, he would sort of uh, sit back and answer for me. And so it was very helpful to have someone who you could trust and who was um, a perfect guide on the path. Okay. Jetsumna? Uh, Jetsumna, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Mm. Okay, uh, my question number eight. Jetsumna, uh, you relativize the role of the guru by saying in page 310, the guru does not give us anything. He or she simply helps us to open up uh, inter, uh, internally. And my question, so the guru's darshan, what we say gaze, his blessings, his attention, etc., are not important? So what I meant was that the qualities of enlightenment, right, are within ourselves already, right? We already have them. It's not that we have to get them from somebody else and nobody's going to give them to us. What they can do is help us to recognize. I mean, like back with the beggar with the treasure under the fireplace. I mean, we already have the treasure. Nobody's giving it. So really and truly, um, the role of the guru, therefore, is not to give us something that we already possess, right? But simply to point out to us what we already have, right? Mm -hmm. And in that case, a blessing or a darshan is what activates this inner opening. That's all, right? They just point at what, and then we, we, in that moment, there is an opening, an inner opening, 
so that we can glimpse at least the treasure, even if it then covers up. But at least that is the initial opening to recognizing the nature of the mind. That's the role of the guru. The most important role of the guru is just to point out to us our own genuine enlightened nature. Okay. That's why people sit, I mean, in, in Hindu tradition, people just sit in front of the guru. The guru doesn't say anything usually, just sits there. But the people open themselves to the blessings. And if they can open themselves with devotion, then the guru is like the sun that's always shining, right? I mean, if, if we go out and sit in the sun, we will get the blessings of the sun. If we sit in our houses and close all the doors and windows and draw the blinds, we can't complain because it's dark. Okay. Uh, Jetsumna, you invite the spiritual seeker to observe and even watch the guru well before choosing him or her as a teacher. You say, quoting the Dalai Lama, who even states that we should spy on the gurus. How do they behave when they are not in the spotlight, page 340. My question, number nine, so there must be perfect consistency between public and private behavior. Sometimes Certainly. we have- Certainly. I mean, if the guru talks publicly about non-attachment, compassion, mindfulness, but behind the scenes, he himself is greedy, angry, and unmindful, then he's a hypocrite, right? Mm. So we need a guru with integrity, right? Who embodies his own words. And this is why it's very difficult because when you see them outside in their public role, it might be very perfect. How to know how they are, you know, when, as I say, they are not in the spotlight amongst their own uh, their own attendants, among, you know, do they treat people who are wealthy donors and patrons differently from how they treat an ordinary person who is of no particular benefit to them, right? Mm -hmm. How are they in private? Is their public face and their private face the same or not? This is difficult for ordinary people to know because you don't see them behind the scenes. Jetsumna, mm -hmm. your own uh, guru teacher uh, has strictly mm. the same behavior in his private life and public life. Oh, he was beautiful. I mean, yes, and I knew because I was his secretary, uh, and uh, often traveled with him. Also, uh, I knew how he was, you know, at all times under all kinds of circumstances. So therefore I could trust him implicitly because he never ceased to uh, manifest his, his Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was very fortunate. I mean, I was very fortunate because I, I had a Lama who was a genuine Lama, mm -hmm. deeply realized, truly compassionate and uh, really a very, very accomplished being. And I could see that because I, I lived almost with them and I saw him all the time. As, as I said, I worked for him. Um, but for many people, the guru is a distant figure. You know, yeah. especially nowadays, popular gurus have hundreds, if not thousands of students. How yeah. to, to know whether this is a trustworthy uh, guru or not? This is... Um, but I think most people, they, they have to trust their own sense of heart connection. Jetsum, now you warn, and my question number 10, number 10 you warn against organizations founded by <laughs> gurus by saying uh, in page 319, you say very often when people get caught up in a fascination for a guru, they end up serving only his or her his or her organization and develop a very narrow vision. For them, there is only their guru. My question, 
it is a realistic and correct observation. I have been experiencing from my own uh, side this problem. Is this the old business of spirituality that is still in vogue? Okay, so really the problem is when a spiritual organization turns into a cult, right? The warning signs to my mind are when the students are discouraged from attending other gurus outside of the organization, right? And encouraged only, for example, to read the books of that particular guru. <laughs> And so students get deeply involved in serving that organization and, and the guru to the extent of thinking only their guru is valid and perfect and that everyone should join up with them. So it would be better to serve one's teacher and the group, keeping an open mind to also appreciate right, other approaches even while one is walking one's own path. This is the thing, not to become too narrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Jetsumna, uh, are you hearing me? Yes, I can see you, I can hear you. Okay, uh, I uh, will continue my question number 11. You continue in the same context to advise spiritual seekers, you say, in page 320, do not make it your ultimate goal to be part of a guru's entourage. It is a waste of time. My question, so the regular or permanent uh, neighborhood of a master is therefore of no interest? Well, you know, of course, it can be very helpful to be near one's teacher and involved in their sangha, uh, their community, you know, since companionship with good friends is very supportive for the spiritual life, you know, and many people are looking for, you know, a community of like-minded people. But the point of gaining spiritual insight is not a matter of becoming a Dharma groupie. This is the problem. Often a community is centered around a teacher and that also gives rise to jealousy, competitiveness, people, uh, covering up and um, also, you know, always trying to get the attention of the teacher to become the favorite part of the inner circle and, and so forth. So this can be quite more problems, right? More, more negativity. So whether we are near or far, the, if one has devotion, then the guru's blessings are there. It doesn't mean we have to be sitting right literally at his feet. We can be a thousand miles away. But if our heart is open with devotion, then the blessings will come. This is the thing. We do not have to be close to the teacher all the time. Sometimes people closest to the teacher in the inner circle are the worst of all, really, you know. They're like courtiers around a king, always trying to gain their favor. And um, this can actually bring out very negative qualities in, in you know, the people uh, surrounding the teacher. They're often the most difficult people of all. So I don't think, I mean, yes, we get the teachings, we go away and we practice and we keep our heart open and all the, the blessings of the spiritual path and the guru will come to us. We don't have to fear. But these problems around the guru, the teacher, uh, what you say, jealousy or uh, conf uh, conflictions uh, uh, between uh, many peoples, uh, competition, etc. Uh, these problems are due to the guru himself, to the teacher, or to the people who are around him. I, I think it depends. I think often it's a, it's a two-way thing. Um, I mean, a, a genuine guru, we would hope, would recognize these, uh, the situation which is surrounding him and do what he can to skillfully release those, those tensions. But often a guru is, um, 
I don't know. They, they, they seem not to be concerned with that. They, they don't seem to worry about that side of things. I don't know why. I mean, some people around the guru and the, the whole sangha around the guru are beautiful and harmonious and dedicated and devoted. And it's a very, very beautiful atmosphere to be with them. Very lovely people, very lovely guru. But other guru scenes can be very divisive, jealousy, and um, somehow you just get that feeling that there's something not right there. And one cannot help but feel that, you know, the, the teacher who is after all at the pinnacle, mm. at the center of the mandala, you mm. know, why is he uh, creating this distorted mandala around him? Okay. Zetsumna, you conclude, uh, you conclude uh, your teaching on the spiritual master by quoting a slogan of the Dalai Lama who says, in page 324, the Dalai Lama said, do not worship the teacher, worship the teaching. And my question number 12, any form of guru worship or veneration that is very common in yoga and, and we, is there uh, therefore useless? Well, so again, you know, the guru, the teacher is the conduit to the teaching, right? So ultimately, but ultimately we go for refuge to the Dharma because the Dharma is timeless and immaculate truth. And it goes beyond any specific uh, teacher. It, it, the teacher themselves should embody the Dharma. You know, they should be, um, they should be the, the vehicle of the truth, right? But it's dangerous when the guru is not a perfect vehicle and then the truth gets distorted, right? So the problem with the traditional guru-chela relationship is that all the power is in with the guru, right? And the chela becomes disempowered. So if the student surrenders and becomes like an empty vessel, then a genuine guru can fill this with the blessings of enlightenment, right? But this is assuming a perfect student and a perfect guru. And if the guru is flawed, then it simply becomes enslavement, right? And it often leads to abuse of power and ultimately this deep, disillusionment with the spiritual path. This is the problem, it's dangerous. But, Can you hear me? okay, okay, continue, continue. Okay. Uh, we found a lot of veneration and even worship uh, in Hinduism and yoga for the guru. Is it useless or a, uh, is it well, as I said, if it's a genuine guru, it's okay. But how many genuine gurus do you know? And so in yoga and in ashrams, there were all these scandals, mm. right? Maybe very, very famous gurus, very world famous gurus. Right. The, they worship the samadhi of the guru. Of students. But it doesn't mean that nonetheless, it was um, a, a really trustworthy situation because all the power is in the hands of the guru. That's the problem. If it's a, a, a really enlightened guru who is the embodiment of wisdom and compassion, then that's fine. We can surrender to that lama, that guru, that teacher. But if they are not, then all this power which is given to them while the student is disempowered because they cannot ever criticize the teacher. Everything the teacher does is, is perfect, even when it doesn't look very perfect. It's not us to criticize the teacher, the teacher is perfect. Then that can become a very dangerous thing. I mean, they are given total power. And if they are pure, then it doesn't matter. Then they take that power and they hand it back in the form of blessing to the student. But if not, then it, it's a, 
a huge temptation for the guru, right? When they know that all these people will do anything they ask them to do without mm -hmm. questioning. Then, you know, unless you are flawless, that's a very dangerous situation. I'm sorry, it is a very dangerous situation. And you can see it because of all these um, scandals which are coming up nowadays. It, but uh, sometimes we say, uh, Sumna, that uh, the veneration of the guru, of the teacher, is a part of Bhakti Yoga. And they say there is no Bhakti Yoga in Buddhism. Only there is uh, uh, Jnana Yoga and uh, Raja Yoga. Is it true? No, 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 no. That's not true. In, in Vajrayana, in Tantra, I mean, they they also absorbed many of these Hindu ideas, but including the one of the veneration for the guru. And so therefore we are, we are taught to see the guru as the perfect Buddha. And as I'm saying, if the, he is, then that's absolutely fantastic and a very quick way through devotion. But if not, then it can be, as they say, the, the guru and the chela hand in hand, jump down the chasm. But we don't see a, a lot of devotion in a Buddhist practice. Mostly it is the way of uh, Raja Yoga, the way of Jnana. Uh... No, 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 no. In Tibetan Buddhism, there's a lot of devotion. Mm. You're thinking of Theravada Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But in, in the Vajrayana Buddhism, which was uh, taken to Tibet, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the Lama and on the disciples' devotion to the Lama and unquestioning um, subservience to the Lama. Mm -hmm. You know, in Western, uh, in a Western world, Europe and America, Buddhism, it's equal meditation and Hinduism, it's mostly equal yoga. Is it true? We don't found yoga, it means uh, physical, yoga in buddhism why and physical it... yoga in buddhism it's not hatha yoga but there are um in the inner tantras there are physical yogas which are very vigorous actually and mm. uh, done in order also to um to loosen the various nadi and to manipulate the prana and so forth i mean that mm. that the, Tantric Buddhism is very different from uh, the kind of Theravadin Buddhism which uh, you're thinking about. Jetsumna? Mm -hmm. Jetsumna? <laughs> Elle va revenir. <rire> elle a été coupée. Ah bon. Ah bah, oui, été... Écoute, aujourd'hui, on a une mauvaise connexion de, toutes les, de tous les côtés. Ben oui, elle... mais bon, c'est pas mal. Tu as encore combien de questions Ou oh, quatre, espérons qu'elle revienne, sinon. D'accord, d'accord. Bah. On va voir. Euh, donc, elle est coupée, elle. Et le problème, c'est que sur euh, mon, euh, euh, mon téléphone, je ne peux pas euh, ménager comme sur l'ordinateur. Je ne vois pas, je ne la vois pas souvent. Oui. Et euh, je ne peux pas bien gérer. Oui. Souvent, euh, je lui pose la question, elle n'est pas devant moi. D'accord, oui. Bref, bref. Avec tout ce qu'on fait, le problème, c'est que. Avec Mais là, on t'entend bien. On, toi, on te voit bien, on t'entend bien. Elle, on la voit aussi. Hein, le... Donc, vous alternez. Donc, de l'autre côté, il n'y a pas de problème. Hein. Voilà. Mais... Bah, C'est ça l'essentiel. Espérons oui. qu'elle va revenir. Oui, oui. On attend un petit peu. On attend. Oui. On n'a pas le choix. Les, les catholiques n'ont pas un saint pour l'Internet. On va prier le saint pour que les lettres reviennent. Ça connecte. Oui, pour nous, comme on dans un Les causes désespérées. Ça marche toujours. Et en fait, non, c'est saint expédite aussi. Eh, 
Jacques, tu es là Oui, Jetsumna. Here we are, back again. OK, OK. <laughs> nice uh, to see you again. Uh, you you was talking Jetsumna about Tantra. There is a big difference between Tantra in, in Buddhism and Tantra in, in uh, Hinduism, or it is the same? Of course, it's not exactly the same, but it's very close. Uh, my own Lama Kanta Rinpoche, he talked with many tantric yogis when he lived in Bengal. Mm. And uh, he, he remarked that really it, it's almost identical, except that Buddhism has bodhicitta, which means that the, the ideal of practice is for the sake of all beings, not just for the sake of one's own. Um, are you here? Yes, yes, I am there. Are you okay. hearing me? So, I mean, Kashmiri Shaivite uh, Tantras are, are, are very close to, uh, to Buddhist Tantras. But the motivation, the motivation in Buddhism is to attain enlightenment in order to liberate all beings. So it, it's the foundation is the compassion for all beings, not just that I want to be liberated, but that we are practicing in order to liberate all living beings and that makes a huge big difference it's not about our own personal fulfillment but in order to be genuinely of benefit throughout time and space not just this lifetime but throughout all our future lifetimes not to leave the wheel but to keep coming back with genuine wisdom and compassion to be able to benefit others in tibetan uh, buddhism uh, Tantra is, is so important and so present? Yeah, it's very important. I mean, it, basically Tantra is a state religion, um, which is why when His Holiness the Dalai Lama gives the Kala Chakra uh, empowerment, uh, maybe 100,000 people at least are present. But uh, uh, when Everybody we... in Tibet says Om Mani Pemi Hum, right? Mm. Mm. The mantra of Mani Pemi Hum. Everybody knows the praises to the, the 21 Taras. I mean, even just ordinary people who don't know anything, but they all know these prayers. They all know mm. these mantras. And they, they uh, recite them. I mean, everybody in the old Tibet, they all had their prayer wheels and their malas, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were... Everybody was doing practice in accordance with their level of understanding. But Jetsumna, when we think and when we talk about Tantra, mostly we think about some sexual practices. Is no, 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 at which there would be any sexual context. And usually that's also, that's visualization. It doesn't necessarily mean physical context. After all, many of the greatest practitioners were celibate monks, right? Mm. I mean, mm. like his own the Dalai Lama. And they did not have a, a, a female consort, but um, as part of the visualization in Tantra, there's a lot of visualization of deities and seeing oneself as a deity. Um, in that, in the highest yoga tantras, there is sometimes a sexual contact. But that is also dealing with um, de the inner yogas of uh, raising the sexual energy up through the central channel and through the various chakras, right? That's part mm -hmm. of the whole tantric practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Uh, Jetsumna, uh, in the context of guru, you talked about uh, G, uh, Jiddu, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti by saying in page 326, I like Krishnamurti very much, but you know, he is very clever. You mean that uh, he is not so practical in his teaching. My question, do you mean by this? And uh, what do you mean by this? He is very clever. And what does he has to do with Buddhism? Jiddu Krishnamurti. 
Well, Krishnamurti was very good at describing the view from the top of the mountain, right? But he could not describe the path to climbing up the mountain, and he did not provide anyone with any tools. So to say that truth is a pathless path is very clever, but it's not very helpful, right? Mm -hmm. He tore down everybody else's spiritual paths and, and destroyed their devotion and their belief systems, but he didn't put anything useful in its place. So they ended up just being very, um, very, very lost, basically. I've known a lot of people who follow Krishnamurti and basically they were lost. He describes choiceless awareness, which is a beautiful word, right? And he describes this very beautifully, choiceless awareness. But this is a prime Buddhist practice. And actually, I, I saw an interview where he was pressed by the interviewer to explain exactly what he, Krishnamurti, meant by meditation, because he talks about meditation, but he doesn't explain what it is. Mm. And then he gave a very clear account of basic Buddhist Mahamudra meditation. So he did have a path and a method. It's just that he didn't want to share it. He thought it was more, more beguiling not to pull down everyone's up belief system and not put anyone in its place. So this was the problem. He was very, very good at describing the, the a level of um, you know, non-dual awareness, but he wouldn't describe, help people how to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, many times uh, we say, uh, Jetson, that Krishnamurti is so close to Buddhism, especially to Nagarjuna. Mm. And even sometimes the Dalai Lama himself said something like that. Is it yeah. true? What is your point of view? Yeah, I think, I mean, he was, as I say, very good at describing the, the, the level, that level of consciousness. He was really very good at that. But he couldn't give you any direction how to get there, right? Mm. He, so it's all very nice talking about the state of non-ego, but how do you get there? And, and mm. what are the stages on the path to getting there? That he never told anybody. Mm. So... Um, Basically, a lot of people who had followed him in the beginning eventually drifted off into something else, right? Which gave a, a much more clear indication, some genuine support for walking the path. You know, mm. not just telling you what the, the destination looks like, but actually giving you a GPS for how to get there. It is due to a, to a uh, according to you, why uh, uh, is it, it is uh, we feel some need some some uh, uh, something uh, we lose in, in his teaching or uh... yeah I mean it's all very inspiring but then what do I do mm. and he never told you what to do mm. so you're left I mean he told you you mustn't have devotion meditation is useless, this is useless, that's useless, everything else is useless, but he didn't put anything in its place. So mm -hmm. he tore down people's buildings, but he couldn't show them how to build up uh, anything to replace it. So they were left with the dissolution of all their beliefs and, and their devotion and their spiritual path, but he didn't hand them anything else to replace it with. So people felt very, you know, confused, basically. Mm -hmm. okay. And he was very brilliant, very charismatic, but yeah. in the end, not helpful. I mean, I saw him, I, I attended some of his teachings many years ago, and he was a very brilliant speaker and very charismatic. But at the end of the day, he didn't leave you with anything you could actually use. Mm -hmm. Uh, for another uh, teacher, uh, Jetsumna Goenka, Goenka, who teach mm -hmm. uh, Goenka, who teach Vipassana, what do you think? What is your point of view about him? Well, again, I mean, I think it's it's a um, it can be a very useful introduction. I mean, it's a bit like throwing because you have to meditate like ten hours a day, and you probably never meditated for ten minutes in your life. 
it's a bit like throwing people into the deep end of a swimming pool. I mean, either they're going to drown or I also very quickly going to learn how to swim. So for a lot of people in the beginning, uh, the first two or three days was agony. Um, but then when they got into the, the, the process of how to actually um, be, uh, enter into this kind of meditation, they found it enormously beneficial. I mean, it might not be that they stayed always with that particular technique. They might go on to something else. But um, I mean, our, our nuns also did uh, two years running uh, a Goenka retreat, 10 day retreat. We um, ladies who teach at his center in Pune in India, they offered to come here and teach, run a, a retreat for the nuns. And so all the nuns did um, consecutively for two years, uh, this 10 day retreat. And they, they benefited a lot. And, and gained a lot of insight because you're really working hard. I don't say it's, it's you know, it gives people a very good taste mm -hmm. and a confidence that they can, they can meditate because, it, you know, even though it's very hard, they, they do get genuine insights from doing this. And as I said, they don't necessarily always stay with the uh, Goenka method, which is only one method. But uh, many, many people uh, have done several uh, retreats and found it very, very beneficial because it's very strict. Mm -hmm. You encourage people so to, to do this kind of retreat? You know, it doesn't hurt. I mean, it's difficult mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you immediately are placed in a situation where you have to sit you know, for hours at a time and, mm. and concentrate on whatever you're being told to concentrate on the sensations of the body. And it, it is very challenging. I mean, it's not an easy course, mm. but as I say, you know, you either completely just can't manage it or else very quickly you learn to swim. Mm. And so most people at the beginning, if they thought they were gonna die, and by the time they finished, they thought that was the best thing they've ever done in their life and uh, really want to do again. Even our, our Tibetan young women who run our office, they did a, a Goenka retreat and came back absolutely glowing and saying, all our nuns should be doing this. So I think it's very good. I don't say it's for everybody, but I think it is very good. It's a total immersion. It Jetsumna in the same field, uh, in the teaching of Buddha uh, itself, we don't found anything about mantra meditation, but we found mantra meditation in Tibetan uh, tradition. Yeah, that's yeah. Tantra. Tantra. Ah, that is from Tantra. Yeah. Okay, but we don't found it in the text of Buddhism. Is not there. The tantras are also Buddhist texts. Hmm. I mean, it, it's it's a branch of the Buddhist texts which are dealing with the tantras. Mm -hmm. You don't well, find it in the Pali canon of the Theravada yeah. school. Yeah. But you do find mantras in the Mahayana sutras, which are carried on in China, Korea, Vietnam, and so forth, Japan. Mm. It is all from tantric uh, uh, origin? There's a tantric influence and some of them are, are pure tantras. I mean, the, the, there is huge, um, uh, vast amount of uh, tantric literature, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. taken from India into Tibet. Okay. My question, uh, number 14, Jetsumna. Speaking of the role of obstacles in life, you say in page 363, you say, if our life is always purely peaceful, our uh, blossom, uh, blossoming will be small. We need the problems of conflict and the difficulties of samsara to be able to purify ourselves and cultivate the virtues. My question, 
So obstacles, negativity, have a positive role in the spiritual path? So, I mean, th this is a very important thing because people think that when life is, is easy and peaceful, that then they can, they can do their practice. And when difficulties come along, very often they just fall apart. So definitely obstacles and difficulties can be called call up important qualities which are needed on the spiritual path, which um, are, are not called into play when life is very peaceful and pleasant, such as patience, empathy, compassion. You know, all of these need challenges to, for us to really be able to develop it, right? So sometimes I, I call that life, you know, the saying that life is the gymnasium of the soul, right? So in that way, you know, when we go to a gymnasium, we don't choose the easy machines. We choose challenging machines, right? In order to get strong muscles. If we're always lying around on silken couches, we're, we're going to get very flabby muscles. So for our spiritual inner muscles, we need sometimes to have challenges in life, right? And so it's about taking everything which happens to us. Good things, if good things happen, that's good. But when difficult things happen, also we can make use of that. So there's a whole branch of um, Buddhist training called mind training or lojong, which is about taking everything, all the situations which we come across, you know, the, all the nice things and the good things, but also loss, sickness, difficult people, difficult circumstances, everything. We can take it to develop inner qualities on the spiritual path. So we shouldn't worry, you know, it, this, this attitude of taking everything on the path takes us beyond hope and fear. Because everything we can make use of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it, uh, is it something like we said in medicine that we need uh, uh, virus, we need bacteria to improve our immune system, otherwise our immune system uh, does not work properly? Well, that's one way of looking at it, you know. I mean, the point is that if we can only be nice people and happy and, and practicing when things go right, and if we fall apart the minute things don't go the way, I, the ego, wants them to go, then clearly our, our practice is very weak. And in order to have inner strength, then we need to be able to um, take all these difficulties and challenges and use them as a path. Okay. So this is a very important, um, you know, just now I, I have a, a book which is, was published just yesterday, a new book, and mm -hmm. that is, uh, a commentary on um, 37 verses on how to take difficulties onto the path. It's a very famous text in the Tibetan tradition. And so I was giving a commentary on 37 practices of a bodhisattva. And most of it is about how to deal with all the challenges we meet in life and how to take that as our spiritual practice. This new book is released in India or in... Uh... Western uh, world? Uh, it's on Google, yeah, Amazon. Amazon. It's on Amazon. It's called, it's called The Heroic Heart. Uh, we can see the, the book. You have it or? Uh... Uh, we'll bring it. I have it in my, in my office. Yeah. We'll, we'll show you. <laughs> OK, OK. So it just got to... published yesterday. Um, and so it's on Amazon at the moment. It is only in English available this moment, not in Yeah, French. it's in English. It's, mm. it's, we need to translate it into French. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's being translated into Portuguese, German, and Spanish. Uh, you know, we are preparing a uh, Jetsumna. We are talking about your book. Here we are. Here's the book. Okay. 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 The error. okay. Mm. Nice to. And it seems a big book. Mm -hmm. It seems a big book, 300 no. or something. No, it's not a very big book, 211 pages. 
Okay. Okay. And uh, we are talking about your books. Uh, the uh, publisher, Italian publisher, wrote to me one week before that she is uh, working on uh, the book of our interviews and uh, maybe it will be available in uh, recent, in a, a few months. Oh, well, that's so, very nice. And Thank also you. the, the French uh, version. Mm -hmm. uh, Jetsumna, my last question for this 10th interview. Uh, uh, it is the uh, question number 15. Speaking on the Karmapa when he was ill, you transmit what one of his relatives told you in page 334. He said, the Karmapa is not ill. He is beyond birth and death. It is only your impure perception that sees him as sick. My question, how to, should we understand this answer, especially since the Karmapa's body was really sick? <laughs> So, I mean, the point is that on an ultimate level, right, someone like the Karmapa, who is a manifestation of his own Buddha nature, he is beyond birth and death, right? It's only on a conventional level, on a relative level, we perceive his body as being sick and dying. So, of course, this applies to us all on an ultimate level. Consciousness, our consciousness is immortal, right? It's deathless. That someone like Karmapa would have realized that, right? So to see the ultimate nature of the Karmapa beyond birth and death is called pure perception. Right? So that's what they meant. They were trying to, you know, jolt me out of my impure perception into pure perception mm -hmm. of recognizing the ultimate nature of the Karmapa, which is beyond birth and death. Mm -hmm. It's for Sakitusin who said this. Okay. Okay. So, Jetsumna, uh, uh, we finish it today. Uh, questions and commentary of your second book, this one, uh, La Vie Quotidienne. It means a, a daily life and a meditative practice. C'est la, la traduction de. Uh, Et donc, euh, réflexion sur le Mountain Lake. Oui. Reflection. Mm -hmm. It's reflection. Okay. And uh, we can start in our next interview, the third and maybe a last uh, uh, book in French, which is Commentary uh, on Meditation. Hope we oui. can uh, discuss all this uh, interest uh, topics of this book because it is a very important book and our professor Jack Veen uh, is, uh, has wrote uh, a commentary and also an introduction introduction of this book. So oui, donc, thanks dans first, ce, uh, for dans ce livre, il y a uh, les deux séminaires de, uh, in this book there are the two uh, 2016 uh, seminaries in beer and in uh, la Mazopas um, Tushita uh, on uh, the 21 verses on um, the Supreme and also uh, Chetawa uh, uh, the training of the mind, seven point of the training of the mind. So there are these two seminars uh, integrally in this book. And also the 37 vows of uh, the Bodhisattva you commented also that we, we took it from the internet. Okay, uh, so thanks, Dr. Vin, for this uh, explanation. Jetsumna, uh, uh, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, so thanks for uh, this nice interview. Uh, hope uh, in the next one we will have less technical problems. Sometimes <laughs> it was from my side, sometimes it was from your side, but at least we could do uh, this interview and ask all these questions. And uh, thanks for your presence and for your guidance. And see you maybe uh, on the 10th interview in October.
Okay, Louis. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. And may you be well and happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jacques, on te voit pas. Est-ce que tu peux apparaître okay. ou on va... Alors... avant de terminer, on va pas trop trop bavarder après ce, ce, cette interview. Oui. Euh, en moi, je suis heureux que j'ai pu le mener jusqu'à la fin, là où j'étais à la clou, qu'il n'y avait pas de, euh, de connexion, j'étais obligé de me déplacer à la dernière minute vers Jbeil pour avoir la connexion là. Oui, et aussi, donc c'était pas un, commode, hein? un tas de problèmes. Ouais, et puis je suis pas habitué, normalement je le fais sur mon ordinateur, espérant que tu as tout enregistré cette fois, parce que oui, moi oui. je n'ai pas pu enregistrer.